What's up guys, welcome to another episode of Scream Theory. Now this video was originally going to be the Anatomy of Metal Vocals Part 2, but since I'm just going to be talking about the false chords, and I wasn't really satisfied with my last false chord screaming tutorial video, well, this video is going to be the ultimate guide to false chord screaming. And no, that is not a clickbait title. I promise that by the end of this video, you will have a supreme understanding of false chord screaming. So, as always, we're going to start off with the anatomy. So here we have an anatomical diagram of the vocal structures. So the right side of the diagram would be the back of the larynx or the posterior portion of the larynx. And then the left side is the front or anterior portion of the larynx. So here we have the vocal cords that I've circled in red. The vocal cords are composed of the vocalis muscle and the vocalis ligament. So the muscle is the pink part, the ligament is the white part, and this means that the vocal cords have a muscle built into them that gives you a little bit of voluntary control over your vocal cords. These big cone-looking gray structures, these are called the arytenoid cartilage, and they are connected in the back by the transverse arytenoid muscle it kind of forms a muscular wall that allows them to come together when this muscle contracts. So now I've added the vestibular ligaments to the diagram. The vestibular ligaments compose the vestibular folds. The vestibular folds are also known as the false cords. But as you can see from this diagram, the vestibular folds or the false cords, they don't have a muscular component the same way that the vocal cords do. So it's actually the surrounding muscles in the throat that allow us to change the length and position of the false cords. So here's another one of my poorly drawn diagrams, and this is a side view of the vocal structures. This is just a single side. I don't have both sides drawn. But what I want you to see from this view is that the vestibular ligaments connect further back on the arytenoid cartilage, whereas the vocal cords connect slightly more in the front bottom of the arytenoid cartilage. Now, we can actually engage all three of these structures. We can engage the arytenoids, the vocal cords, and the false cords, depending on what noises we're trying to make. So imagine if we directed our airflow straight through the bottom, like normally, to vibrate our vocal cords, well, we could also engage our false cords to vibrate along that path of airflow. But now imagine that we tried to direct that airflow more posteriorly. Well, if we direct the airflow towards the back, we can actually make our arytenoid cartilages vibrate a little bit, and the more posterior portion of the false cords can also vibrate. But because the vocal cords are connected slightly further up, they don't get that much of an engagement when you direct the airflow more towards the back. Now, this is important because this will allow us to make different types of sounds. And the main thing I want you to take away from this is we can either direct the airflow to vibrate both our vocal cords and our false cords simultaneously, or we can direct the airflow so that we're vibrating our arytenoid cartilage and the posterior portion of our vestibular folds with not so much vocal cord engagement simply because they're not in that path of the airflow. So very quickly, I wanna talk about a study titled Measurement of Vocal Folds, Elastic Properties for Continuum Modeling. It was published in 2012, and what the researchers of the study did was they took samples of false cord and vocal cord tissue from cadavers. They subjected those samples to different types of stress to see how they handle those different types of stress. I'll post it in the description. It does get very deep with the medical and biomechanical terminology, but what I really want to summarize is right down here in the conclusion. So they talk about a nonlinear behavior of the vocal cord tissues to increase in stiffness at higher rates of strain. What this means is that the vocal cords not only have to be elastic and be able to stretch far apart and come back together kind of like a rubber band, but they also have to be stiff and rigid so that they can maintain their shape. So think about high pitch singing. When you raise your pitch when singing, you are making the vocal cords have to vibrate faster and that is much more stressful. So the vocal cords have to stretch apart and they need to be somewhat stiff so that they don't experience deformity or they don't change their shape or they don't get injured while you're doing that type of activity. The false cord tissue on the other hand is actually more soft. It's not as stiff it's not as elastic, 
the false cord tissue deforms much more easily than the vocal cord tissue. It doesn't take a lot of stress or strain to make the false cord tissue start to change shape and get injured a little bit. And this is why when you first start false cord screaming, it's gonna feel a little bit uncomfortable. It may make your throat itch and your eyes water. It may even be a little bit painful. The bright side to this is that unlike the vocal cords, when you damage the false cords, they are very good at returning to their original shape rather quickly. Vocal cord injuries take much longer to heal because of the properties of the vocal cord tissue. Although the false cord tissue might be softer and not as good at handling lots of stress the way the vocal cords are, the false cords can recover from stress very well. So conditioning your false cords to be able to handle lots of intense false cord screaming without it feeling uncomfortable, without it making your throat itch and your eyes water, it's just a matter of conditioning. It's the same thing when we work out and exercise our muscles, progressive overload. What you do today will make you come back stronger tomorrow. So to get started with false cord screaming, you're gonna wanna start with a low pitched, false cord scream. Now, this is going to involve your arytenoids more than your actual false cords. So just keep that in mind. But what you're going to want to do is imagine you are trying to bring your entire larynx down. You're trying to lower your Adam's apple, and you can do that by shoving your tongue back into your throat. I kind of like to take the tip of my tongue and uh, touch the, the roof of my mouth or my soft palate, kind of like this. Once you have that, just do a relaxed exhale. It doesn't need to be forceful, but just make sure it's coming from deep within your torso. Push with your diaphragm. Obviously, don't use your chest. And when you do exhale, uh, try to make the airflow bypass your vocal cords and vibrate your false cords and your arytenoids. And it should produce a sound very similar to this. <coughs> If you're new to this, then the sound you produce may sound a little more gravelly and it may break a little more often. Uh, it's very hard to get a consistent tone and a consistent set of vibrations going when uh, you're just starting uh, false chord screaming. So that noise that I just made um, was very dominant with my arytenoids. And if I were to try to isolate my arytenoids to make them just vibrate on their own with very minimal involvement of my false chords and my vocal chords, it would sound like this. <laughs> it produces a very guttural, gurgly noise. And so once again, low-pitched false chord screams usually have a lot of arytenoid involvement. If I were to just push more air and try to engage my arytenoids even more, it would take off and sound like your general false chord low. So, a lot of people will very easily get to the point of where they can do a decent sounding false chord low, but I've noticed a lot of people have an issue with being able to do high pitched false chord screams. I'm talking the very high pitched ones that just come out and slap you in the face. Well, I've noticed that a lot of people don't know to make the distinction between the arytenoid vibrations versus a true isolation of the false chord vibrations. So what you want to do is attempt to isolate your false chords without any involvement of the arytenoids. You see, the arytenoid cartilage cannot stretch. The false chords can stretch, and when they stretch, uh, they produce higher pitched frequencies, which will allow you to do high pitched false chord screams. So a really good technique for doing this is throat singing. You see, throat singing is just a very light, subtle version of false chord screaming. 
And so what you want to do is generate some airflow, the same thing you did when you were practicing the low-pitched false chord screams. But you want to let that airflow kind of bypass the vocal cords and vibrate the false chords. And there's not really an easy way to explain throat singing other than try to mimic this noise. <clears throat> Basically, you're trying to sound like a didgeridoo, and once you start getting the hang of that, well, just push a little more air and open your mouth more, and it will turn into a high-pitched false chord scream. It's the subtle but fast vibrations of the false chords that you want. Practicing throat singing will allow you to gain a lot of control over your false chords. Good false chord screaming, people that master it, they pretty much get the ability to where they can just talk with their false chords. They're not pushing so hard to keep them vibrating. Um, really, it's just your throat singing with a little more force. And a really good example of a vocalist that uh, kind of took his false chord screaming in a direction to where it just sounds really creepy and not forced, it really just sounds very similar to throat singing, would be the vocalist for Dark Tranquility. So trust in shapes of combined resolve, they're triggered from a less than solid case, photo of attacks of resurfaced lost, but the grazing ground. When you false chord scream this way, when you just try to do throat singing with a little more gusto and oomph, well, it just sounds like a growl. It's, it gives you that growl noise that a lot of people want. But when you take false chord screaming to its logical extreme, then you get the very scary demonic noises that you would expect from like Job for a Cowboy, Carnifex, Vulvodynia, uh, Shores of Elysium. My legs reach out of the sight of this damage program! This program kept you breathing! It kept you alive! So, there can be some versatility in the way it can sound, but generally speaking, the distortion that characterizes false chord screaming typically has this very loose and wet sound to it. You don't get any of the screechy, staticky sounds that you would get from like the fry scream. For the most part, it's just this this very loose, open, uh, wet noise. Now, another piece of advice I have for you is don't focus on trying to produce the scariest blood curdling noises possible. You see, that's the easy part. That comes with time. Uh, the hardest part of false chord screaming is stamina and control. So practicing the throat singing method will help you get control and stamina because you're teaching yourself to isolate the false chord vibrations so that you know you don't have to push any extra air to make the arytenoids constantly rumble. But also, uh, it just takes time for your false chords to condition and just want to naturally vibrate very fast on their own with very little airflow required. When you have stamina and control over your false chords, um, you're going to be able to pronounce all your syllables. Every word you say is just going to come out more clear. Your false chords aren't going to break or stop vibrating during uh, certain positions of your mouth and throat. Uh, you're going to want to just gain the control it takes so that you can really pronounce your words with a lot of force and you know you're not trying to perform gymnastics with your mouth just to be able to say uh, a complex set of words uh, you want people to be able to understand you and false chord screaming is the type of screaming that is very difficult 
to understand because a lot of people do just try to make the scariest blood curdling noises possible without really focusing on pronunciation and diction. Whenever I listen to a false chord vocalist and I can actually understand what they're saying throughout every single syllable they pronounce and their false chords are just continuously vibrating no matter what words they're pronouncing, well, that's what I can tell are the markings of a good false chord vocalist. And so the last thing I want to talk about is how to distinguish between vocal cord discomfort and false chord discomfort. Because when you first start learning, yeah, it's going to feel uncomfortable. So one telltale sign that you've stressed out your vocal cords during a practice session is after your practice session, maybe an hour after you've finished practicing. Um, if you notice a sensation of tightness or pressure right on your Adam's apple. What's happening with that is the muscles that surround and help control the vocal cords, those muscles are guarding. They're contracting very hard to prevent the vocal cords from moving. It's a protective mechanism. The same thing happens whenever you damage a joint. Let's say you tear your ACL in your knee or you dislocate your shoulder. Uh, the muscles that surround the joint are going to tighten up and lock. They're going to contract really hard to prevent any movement in that joint. The same thing happens with your vocal cords whenever you damage them. Um, the surrounding musculature is going to tighten up and become really stiff just as a protective mechanism. Another sensation that you should avoid is if, let's say you finished practicing and you try to swallow. Maybe this is 30 minutes after a practice session, an hour after a practice session. If you try to swallow and you can actually feel your vocal cords come together when you swallow, when they touch each other, if when they touch each other, that feels like a pins and needles sensation or like a, a kind of sharp, um, to me it kind of reminds me of the sensation of like swallowing sand or something very coarse. Uh, that is a sensation that you want to avoid. You, you don't want to feel that. I mean, there have been times when I've stressed out my vocal cords completely and uh, had to stop practicing for a week or two. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, but, you know, you just, you got to be diligent. Uh, you have to really develop uh, a sense of being able to tell when you're using your vocal cords too much. Um, and it's really hard to remember the feeling of the false chord discomfort because I learned over 10 years ago and the pain, the discomfort, it starts to go away after just a few months of practice. So if you practice for five to 10 minutes a day and you're starting to get that, that discomfort sensation in your false chords, um, you know, five to 10 minutes of practice a day shouldn't be enough to, you know, destroy your vocal cords. So if you can develop a sense of uh, the difference between the false chord discomfort and vocal cord discomfort, in fact, if you were to just scream at the top of your lungs using your vocal cords in a very unhealthy way, uh, that's how you can know what vocal cord discomfort feels like. And so if you're just curious as to know what that sensation is, then, you know, try it. Try it. Just, just, ah, just yell like that uh, really loud, and you'll know what it feels like to stress out your vocal cords. And as long as you don't get that feeling whenever you're practicing false chord screaming, then you should be good to go.